trying to know. Is that you? Yes. Oh my God, come on. Uh, there we go. Are we sharing this? Yes, we are. Okay. Cool. So once again, I'm Zach Ozavadi, and I work at the, <coughs> excuse me, the Survey Impact uh, Dust Accelerator at the University of Colorado, and I will be talking about the generation and detectability of organic chemistry yes, in hypervelocity impact hydrometric. So I probably don't really have to convince you that ice is prevalent in the we find it on spoons, uh, and all that. And I probably don't have to convince too many of you that dust is also pretty prevalent, but as much as 30 tons of it is actually delivered to the Earth's upper atmosphere every day. This is just saying that dust is kind of everywhere, and it's constantly interacting with uh, various bodies throughout the world. Additionally, uh, around icy ocean world, uh, there are various processes that lift icy dust grains from the surface, the ice crust surface of these uh, worlds, to the local environment. And there are also plumes at least on the Caledonia, and probably also on Europa, that uh, bring icy dust grains from the subsurface ocean also to the local environment. Oh, and this is exploited good. by an entire class of instruments, impact ionization time of flight instruments, uh, on flyby spacecraft uh, to study these icy dust grains and figure out what their composition is. On the generation but and important to have laboratory support for uh, these types of. Uh, this is by Zach. Yeah, somebody the is. Somebody is. Somebody needs to mute their their system because we're getting a lot of interference. Um, it's not you. It's just somebody yeah. else. Everybody, please mute their telephones so the speaker can speak freely. Cool. All righty. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so there are icy dust grains and uh, impact ionization time of flight instruments. We'd like to study their composition. But in order to make sense of these results, it's important to have laboratory support with tightly calibrated or tightly controlled experiments involving dust interaction with ice. And additionally, because dust and ice are so prevalent in the solar system, uh, dust impacts may be an important production mechanism for various types of organic chemistry. Uh, in fact, it's expected to be at least as important as charged particle or UV irradiation, but because it's so difficult to study, there hasn't really been a lot of experimental evidence for it. But fortunately, we have the Colorado Dust Accelerator, which is capable of launching particles of up to about a micron in size at velocities of up to 100 kilometers a second. Now, iron dust is kind of our workhorse, but really we can shoot anything that is conductive, anything we can put a charge on it. And if it's not conductive, we, can, we might be able to wrap it in gold and then shoot it anyway. So <clears throat> you can see here, it's actually where the dust is uh, launched from. It goes down our beam line to our experimental chambers at the back, and there's various targets that we have there. Uh, purposes of this talk, we'll be talking about the cryogenic ice target, which is a vacuum system with a copper target in the center. Uh, on this copper target, we grow or install ice surfaces, and we actively cool it using fluid, flowing liquid nitrogen. Uh, we then expose the ice surfaces to the dust beam coming from the accelerator, and as the dust hits, it creates an ejecta plume uh, from the impact. Ions within that plume are then accelerated uh, by an electric field produced by this acceleration grid, and they're accelerated down a time of flight tube to our MCP detector. Now, we give everything the same kick, which means that the light ions reach the MCP much quicker than the heavy ions. And so the ions spread out in time, but also by mass, and this allows us to analyze the chemistry of what that plume is. So that's what we're interested in. We're interested in studying the chemistry of the plume created in this, this impact here. But in order to do that, we, of course, need to grow ice first. So we have a couple different production mechanisms. Here on the left is our vapor deposition system. Uh, what we do is we pump the system down to vacuum, cool the target through our, with our liquid nitrogen, and then allow a very small amount of vapor into the system of whatever it is we're interested in studying. Uh, particles, will, when they reach the surface, because it's actively cooled, will freeze in place. And so slowly over time, you can grow an ice surface in a very tightly controlled way. But really, for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to be talking about our flash freezing system over here. The limitation of the vapor deposition is that a lot of things don't vaporize properly. If you ever had a glass of salt water and let it sit there, what you find is that the water would evaporate, but the salt would stick behind. And so you can't create, you can't grow a uh, salty ice surface through vapor deposition. Uh, additionally, if you tried to freeze that glass slowly, what you'd find is that the salt wouldn't freeze evenly throughout the ice. You'd get clumps of pure salt surrounded by clumps of pure water. But if you freeze it very quickly, then the salt doesn't have time to uh, move around and instead freezes in place. 
So that's why we've created this flash reading system here. You can see there's this L-shaped copper piece on top. We can actually remove that from this copper block down here. So this upper assembly here is removable. We put a couple drops of whatever solution we're interested in studying into our target plate here, and then slide a Vestal cover into place. Then throw the whole thing into liquid nitrogen so it freezes almost instantly. It freezes very quickly, and the salt doesn't have time to move around. It instead freezes in place, and you have a nice homogeneously distributed ice surface. Then we install it into our system, and in vacuum remove the Vestal cover, and expose the surface to the dust beam. And so that way, the ice is also not contaminated by atmospherics. Now, we can do all kinds of stuff with this. We can do salts. We can put amino acids in there, for example. Um, now, as I mentioned before, time of flight instruments on flyby spacecraft aim to measure organic chemistry in icy dust. However, um, in experiments involving single amino acid molecules, when they're shot at solid targets, they fragment at typical flyby speeds, so they shatter. And typical flyby speeds are usually around 5 kilometers a second. Now, this would kind of imply that these instruments may not be ideally suited to studying this type of chemistry because you can't measure them directly. You could only measure their breakup products if they shatter upon impact with, with your instrument. However, complex organic molecules that are in ice may be shielded from the impact stress by the ice matrix itself. And so then, of course, the million-dollar question is, does complex organic chemistry in ice survive impact at typical flyby instrument velocity? Give you a hint, the answer is yes. What we did is we doped our water ice using our flash freezing system with lysine, a simple amino acid, uh, specifically at a one molar concentration. So this is the kind of data that we produce. This is the time of flight spectrum. For those of you that are not familiar, obviously on the x-axis here we have time, uh, and then on the y-axis we have the amplitude of our signal. But again, because the ions spread out in time according to their mass, uh, each of, uh, that means each of these lines corresponds to a different mass, which means it has a different type of chemistry. Now, you can see these blue things here. These are all water clusters, which is a characteristic of just, you know, the impacts into water ice. You can see there's actually pure water one. This is protonated water, which is actually how water tends to uh, ionize. There's water one, water two, water three, and so on. But you can also see our lysine here. So this spectrum was produced, again, at a one molar concentration, but an impactor velocity of iron dust at 6.7 kilometers a second. And you can see that the lysine survives the impact and can be detected directly. But also, you see a cluster here, two lysine molecules that are gripping together. And so this shows that they survived the impact. But additionally, we can look at even more complicated organic chemistry. This is a similar experiment using a 0.1 molar concentration of lysine glycine, which is a dipeptide amino acid chain. So it's more complicated, and it's much more fragile than the simple amino acid itself. And lo and behold, there it is. So you can see this. And what this, this is an important result, because it's saying that even at this impactor velocity of 4.8 kilometers a second, you can still see this fragile, complex organic chemistry. It survives the impact process, which means this type of instrument, it will be able to measure this type of chemistry. Now, I also mentioned in the beginning that because ice and dust are so ubiquitous, that dust impacts may be an important uh, way to change the surface chemistry over long periods of time of airless icy bodies. Uh, in fact, you saw in several, er, in, like, for example, in Dale Kruitschek's talk early this morning, there was CO2 in uh, a lot of the Saturnian system and various other places. Uh, and so this is typically thought to have been produced by charged particle uh, bombardment or UV irradiation that creates CO2 from native uh, carbon or carbon that's been brought from exogenic sources. But dust impacts are typically not considered, um, again, because of the dearth of experimental evidence. However, we believe that carbon-bearing dust impacts into H2O may also be able to produce CO2. However, it would be in such a small amount that it might be difficult to detect. So then the next question we have is, can our instrument actually detect trace levels of CO2? Now, the spoiler, the answer is yes. What we did is we bubbled gaseous CO2 into water and then froze that water using our flash freezing system. And you can see there's our CO2. And again, it's pro protonated with a hydrogen atom. Now, this uh, spectrum was produced by an impactor at 15 kilometers a second. But really, we see the CO2 at a wide variety of velocities, from low velocities up to high velocities. We see it everywhere. The peak is never terribly high but it's pretty consistent. We see it all the time. And this is at a low concentration. The CO2 to H2O mole fraction is 6 times 7 to the minus 4. So it's a very trace amount, and yet we can still see it. Now, we don't know exactly what the minimum detection limit is, and so that's what we'd like to study next. Uh, for, we'd just like to reduce the concentration of CO2 to determine when we can no longer see it at all. But then what we'd really like to do is look at the generation of CO2 through dust impact, which would probably be something like shooting graphite dust into pure water to see if we can produce it. 
Now, the long-term goal would, of course, be to produce much more complex organic chemistry. What if we could produce amino acids through this type of impact? That would be a very interesting result. But while it's tempting to just jump right into this, it's also, unfortunately, very difficult. Uh, when you have a lot of complicated stuff, your, your spectrum become very complicated, and it's difficult to know what anything is. And so you have to slowly step up the complexity uh, to eventually reach uh, that goal, which is kind of what we're working on. Now, with regard to our detection experiments, survivability and detectability of organic chemistry for flyby spacecraft, what we'd really like to do next is introduce salt compounds to our water to see how the ion yield and detectability change. This is important because on Europa, we know that the ice surface is actually pretty salty. Um, then what we'd like to do is look at uh, known linear combinations of amino acids. If you could, if I show you a spectra with a solid lysine line, I can't tell you what the concentration of lysine was from that spectrum. But if I say if I made a 50-50 mix of lysine and arginine, and then I statistically find the, the ratio between the two peaks, I might be able to give you a relative calibration between these two, which would also be an important result. It would help constrain results from upcoming missions, such as the SUDA on the Europa Clipper. And after that, we'd uh, like to look at the production of, or excuse me, the detectability of fatty acids in pure H2O as well. So with that, I'll leave you with this cool picture of our flash freezing system in use, um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Open for questions. <coughs> so this is the flash freezing system in use? Yes, I mean... What are we looking at? Yeah, so I say in use, I mean, we're not, this is a test run, really. Uh, so if you recall, the, we put a couple drops of our solution here in the center and then slide the cover into place and drop it into liquid nitrogen. This is right after I uh, pulled it out of the liquid nitrogen and then removed the cover just to see if we got a good ice surface. And you can see it here. There's actually also a blue crust here, which is like this weird, like, lysine copper salt mixture. And I don't really know what it is, but um, that was just because this was a test run and I wasn't really putting a whole lot of effort into cleaning it. Just so to, that came out after you pulled it out, it had the blue ring? Yes, uh, uh, yes. Actually, that, that's just from residue from a previous test. Oh. Because, like I said, this, since this wasn't a real run, I was just kind of you know, going quick, but yeah. Are you good? You said you're, you have dust screen sizes from 0.1 to 1 micron, or 1 to 10 microns. Mm -hmm. Are you able to control that? Yes. So we can't. We can't literally control it in the sense that we don't tell the accelerator shoot this dust particle. But what we can do is we can measure the dust particles non-destructively in flight, and then we have a, a system, a particle selection unit, which is controlled by us that says, okay, I only want to look at particles between this mass range or this. Know, uh, size range, this velocity range, or whatever. And so, while we can't directly control the accelerator, we can throw out all of the particles that we don't want. They don't collide. And they do not collide. And so we, we can still have very tightly controlled uh, experiments across all of the different dust parameters. That, that's, a, that's an accelerator operator's answer. A uh, user's answer is, yes, we can control which particles get to yeah. the target you know, through this mechanism, but yes, we can control within that range, which, which particles get to the target. Um, so no questions in the tap box, but you have words of encouragement. Good stuff. Keep it up. From the standpoint of age dating the rings, very important to know what mass fraction of refractory organics, e.g. solon, in projectiles get converted to light, non-absorbing materials like CO2, CH4. I was going to ask, so you said you were doing impacts into, into CO2 water mixtures, mm -hmm. right? Do you observe any production of carbon monoxide during that? Uh, we haven't yet, but I also haven't really been looking for it. Okay. So I, I should say that um, almost all of the plots that I've shown today were produced in like the last like month, or, or rather with the last two months. And I've been in Europe for the past three weeks. So really, I mean, it's, it's yeah, we haven't really um, looked at a lot of this data. We've, yeah, or in, in the detail that we would like to yet. Mm -hmm. But um, when, we, when we do our experiments producing CO2, we're obviously also going to be very interested in production of CO. Any last questions? Yes, we have a question. Okay. Yeah, Zach, that's re really exciting and uh, very, very promising. I'm just wondering if um, in the data you already have or uh, will be getting, if you can uh, approach the issue of, ma of the isotopic fractionation to see uh, if that's altered by the, uh, the impact process or does it basically faithfully record uh, the initial starting isotopic concentration. I'm speaking specifically of carbon-12, carbon-13. Um, I, I, I don't have the data right now. I, I can't really answer that question right now. So, 
So, Dale, are you suggesting that the different isotopes would chemically react in a different way and would evolve differently on the surface? No, I guess I'm asking a question related to the experimental procedure. Um, well, I'm not sure exactly what question I'm asking because <laughs> the idea of, of I mean, uh, an isotopic anomaly on Phoebe uh, based on the VIMS data is quite new and um, it could be relevant to the origin of the CO2 on Phoebe. Uh, is it primordial, so to speak, from the solar nebula or is it the stuff that's more characteristic of the, the inner solar system uh, or the planetary region of the solar system? So uh, it might be possible well, can, to in question anyway. I can say this, Dale, that, you know, we are able to see isotopic fractions in lots of other things which basically faithfully reproduce kind of the natural abundances on Earth in normal samples. So our expectation is fully that we would just see a, a standard ratio directly in the mass lines. A standard ratio meaning uh, what was originally in the target. Exactly, exactly right. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, let's move on to the next talk. We are behind schedule, uh, but that's okay. It's a workshop and we're having good discussions. But let's do move on to the next talk. Thanks, Zach.